I have a small video for you. We'll begin with Arun Joshi today and move on to RK Narayan. So just to quickly go through Arun Joshi, I have a small animation video for you. Also because most of you had remarked that the video that we showed yesterday was quite interactive and quite interesting perhaps. So uh, initially I was a little bit hesitant because that seems rather childish uh, and we are all mature adults and I was a little bit skeptical while showing that video of Ruskin Bond story yesterday, David Copperfield. But then because most of you had inboxed me saying that uh, it was kind of interesting and uh, a little bit more of a relief than a monotonous lecture. So I thought I'll begin with one today and maybe I'll chip in with one more if we have time later. All right. physicist, main character, and also conflicts of tradition. The story has four main characters Dr. Khanna is an outstanding immigrant physicist at the University of Wisconsin. Kundan Lal, who is Dr. Khanna's father. Radhe Mohan, who is an Ashtam Farosh. And Joanne, who is Dr. Khanna's wife. The story begins when Dr. Khanna visits India with his wife and two sons, 15 years after he had left India for higher studies. And his family is welcomed by the relatives. Uh, they have a lot of gifts for the relatives as well. It's just a formality. Um, all of the gifts are inexpensive. However, the Gillette razors are uh, cherished by the mothers of teenage sons. So towards the end of their trip, Joanne and the children go sightseeing. Dr. Khanna delivers his final talk at a college in his uh, former hometown and uh, then the anti-climax happens when one Mr. Radhe Mohan approaches Dr. Khanna. Radhe Mohan is an Ashtam Farosh. He sells court paper in front of the district courts and he knew Dr. Khanna's father when he was alive. Radhe Mohan's appearance reminds Dr. Khanna of his own father and although the principal of the college tries to make him go away, he is very persistent and he continues to talk to Dr. Khanna. He then continues to talk about Dr. Khanna's father with a long monologue and he tells him how his father used to be very proud of his son. So the Ashtam Farosh tells Dr. Khanna that his father expected him to return to the village and uh, when Dr. Khanna got married, he was quiet for many months but then he started telling everybody that his son was the only American from their village. Kundanlal used to get angry with his friends if they did not show interest in listening to uh, him about his son. And um, suddenly he began to shave every day. He bought two new shirts for himself. He also purchased a suit for himself. And he also told his friend Ashtam Farosh that he was expecting his son to send him a ticket to visit America. So Radhe Mohan asks Dr. Khanna why he did not send a ticket to his father to visit America. At first Dr. Khanna is confused and then he replies that he did not have the money. But we know that he was doing very well for himself and we know that he is lying. Radhe Mohan continues to tell Dr. Khanna about Kundanlal. He says that his father was so poor during his childhood that he couldn't even wear proper clothes or even shoes to school. And when they had to cross a stretch of sand which was very hot during the summer, Kundanlal would scoop a handful of dark leaves and tie them with a string on his feet and then cross the sand. And if the string came off, he would jump around screaming on one foot when his friend would tie the leaves back onto his foot and then Kundan Lal would cross the Cho and this is how he crossed it for 10 years. Radhe Mohan continues to tell Dr. Khanna that when his father fell ill, his sister came to visit him and uh, he had also sent a telegram asking him to visit his father. But Dr. Khanna had not come and after he got better, he took Radhe Mohan with him and visited his old school and on the way back, he kicked off his shoes and insisted on crossing the Cho by wearing a few dark leaves on his feet. Radhe Mohan says that Kundan Lal had gone mad because he insisted on crossing the hot Cho with only dark leaves on his feet and even those leaves fell off on the way but he crossed the whole half mile without stopping. When he reached home, he had fever. The next day, he died. After telling him the story, the Ashtam Farosh disappears into the darkness. That weekend, Dr. Khanna and his family board a plane to America. In the plane, 
Joanne Khanna is heard telling her husband, "You keep staring at your feet. I have been watching you for the last 2 days and you have done nothing but stared at your feet." So the narrator ends the story by telling us that Dr. Khanna has periods of great burning in his feet and his output of research is zero and he is now known as the man who does nothing but stare at his feet. With that we come to the end of the story the only american from our will all right learners so finally let's get the day started i had told you that we'll come back today and we'll discuss arun joshi and rk narayan today yesterday if you remember we had discussed ruskin bond and uh, there is one small thing i missed out regarding ruskin bond because we discussed bond yesterday as a writer of children's fiction so i told you about uh, how he uses children's fiction as a tool to enlighten children or in a way use the geopolitics to uh, to fine tune students towards uh, uh, an environmental responsibility we discussed about a few stories of his and also we came through the stories that are prescribed for your study i also gave you the link of a course run by ruskin bond on how to become short story writers so one small thing i missed out is it's not that it is important but sometimes classes become so one sided that we may overlook the other possibilities so when i focused on children's literature because the, the stories stories included in the syllabus belongs to children's literature there is one aspect i missed out ruskin bond also touches various other interesting intriguing subjects for instance there is this amazing work by ruskin bond titled susanna and her seven husbands it is a grotesque intriguing crime thriller sort of a novel and it was later made into a bollywood movie starring uh, priyanka chopra and uh, john abraham and so on titled sat kun maaf so just in case you have seen that movie you would know it's quite of a thriller genre so ruskin bond also writes stories like that but then he also writes stories with uh, children in mind and mazuri and dera doon and uh, the lokel in mind so i just wanted to add that before we begin so speaking about arun joshi i had already told you Uh, your study material introduces him as someone who is equated with uh, Franz Kafka and uh, Albert Camus and so on and so forth. So, <laughs> alienation with the self is one of the prime concerns that comes with um, existential novels. So, when it comes to existential novels, alienation is something that surges for primarily. And why does it happen so? it happens so because existential novels happens somewhere after the second world war or during the second world war so by the time the world experienced the two world wars and the great economic depression in between um, everything including the value system religion everything started to recede so the moment you lose hold of the value system and when you try to rationalize your life or reason with your life happens Uh, it becomes a farce or it becomes absurd in theatrical terms so uh, life becomes meaningless we raise questions like who am i what am i or what is the purpose of my life because i am born and because i'll die and in between that maybe i'm not courageous enough to die i try to uh, undergo the suffering called life so this is what the nihilistic absurdist Uh, existentialist writers have always advocated so this in theater took the form of expressionist uh, sorry uh, absurdist theater and uh, in novel it took the form of existentialist novels albert camus jean paul sartre and all were the exponents of this in the west when it comes to india arun joshi or his short stories dealt with the theme of alienation the study material gives you uh insight into a couple of his other short stories i'm not going into detail but one fa- one other facet that i would like you to be familiar with i'm using this critical terms for you to be aware of because when it comes to your exams it's not a mere summary that's going to help you but it's also going to be these uh, key terms so existentialism the theater of the absurd similarly multiculturalism are all things that would be better if you are familiar with so multiculturalism happens when you have a subject who is born in one nation 
and then he or she goes to another story i mean another nation and what happens he wants to belong there and he doesn't want to come back here but at the same time this betwixt and between your study material again gives an example of a story of a short story called the foreigner written by cindy obroy where uh, there is a, a protagonist who saw himself as an uprooted young man living in the latter half of the 20th century who had be become detached from everything except himself his alienation from the world is not merely one of geography or nationality it is rooted within his soul like an ancient curse and drives him on from crisis to crisis this is quote from your study material uh, and this is from the short story the foreigner by cindy obroy uh, we could see parallels in most of the uh, existentialist novels for example in a novel called outsider it's, it's it has two titles the stranger or the outsider last trangere or la outsider that's a that's a french name that that novel has in that novel that novel begins with a statement by the protagonist the statement goes like this mama died mama means mother mother died yesterday or today i don't remember quite i'm on my way for her funeral i hope you understood the character is speaking about his mother and his mother's demise but then he appears to be quite unaware of when the time really is he's totally cut off from what is surrounding him he's totally clueless about the chaos that's happening around him and he cannot relate when actually his mother died maybe it was yesterday maybe it was a day before maybe it was a week back nonetheless he is on his way to attend his funeral that's how uh, alienated an individual probably is in a post war society where everything including faith and religion is receding again a small digression before coming back to arun joshi's story a famous diplomat as well as uh, educator in kerala his name is murali tumarakudi just in case you go and have a look at his facebook page murali tumarakudi had shared a had, had shared a facebook post recent he says that uh, um, liking for subjects like history english language and literature and uh, religion is waning in america over the last decade or so and uh, the liking is more towards uh, the so called job oriented courses uh, business studies and so on and so forth so there were quite a lot of people who disagreed with murli tomarakudi's findings because he was claiming that history should be banned from the academy and there were quite a lot of people who had who took offense because history has to be banned as what murli tomarakudi said and as a literature teacher i took offense as well because he was also claiming that literature and art subjects should be banned this is probably a popular claim that most of the non literature people have especially science teachers have for a long time and we know that especially in kerala there are quite a lot of schools where uh, not people who are post graduates in english but people who are science teachers who take english classes for at least high school students so that's unfortunate as far as i'm concerned so when professor murli tumarakudi posted this uh, so many people got offended because he was calling for the ban of or the abandonment of courses arts and uh, you know bachelors and uh, masters courses in history and uh, literature and so on because they were not job oriented or not catering to the job markets in the current world scenario but then one difference of opinion that i had and one thing that i told him in response was that what would this world become if not for literature history and religion i'm not talking about an extremist religious perspective when i say religion but then at a very medial position without the mediators like priests or people who spread superstition religion is a ray of hope for people to live in life or in after life for those who believe it so does literature i was telling that the this, the the disagreement that i had with the same was what would this world be without literature religion and uh, history because literature familiarizes you to different cultures to different peoples their ways way of living in particular their manners their culture their cuisines and so many other things so the more you read literature you get accustomed to different types of lives and you realize that this world would survive no matter how people are 
eventually this world is encompassed of different types of people and it 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 knows how to survive despite these differences so uh, the same with history without a sense of history what ts eliot calls as a historical sense uh, there is uh, i mean we cannot really move further without having that historical sense same with religion i'm not extending that discussion but coming back to multiculturalism multiculturalism is something where we have different cultures mingled together and we have this uh, diasporic writers people who migrate from one nation to another and earn their living in a in a diasporic country and they try to write from the diaspora uh, with feelings for the uh, homeland probably nostalgic longing or the contradiction between the two places i can give you quite a lot of examples uh, regarding the two but for the time being let me stick to uh, arun joshi's story so in arun joshi's story we have this central character called dr kanna so dr kanna comes to his home space uh, he is a popular physicist in the university of wisconsin <laughs> and he comes back to his homeland with his wife who is a foreigner he has married a foreigner and he's had kids and he comes back to his homeland after a long time so this is how narratives can give you two different stories so in the beginning we realize or we we come across the tale of dr kanna so dr kanna comes back to his homeland and because he is a well known physicist he he receives a fine reception he is on a four week trip and because he banks on a success uh, his fame has preceded him he is received by an official of the council of scientific research he addresses a conference on inter planetary radiation he inaugurated three well attended seminars he meets the president and the prime minister the honorable president and the prime minister he is offered many jobs and uh, he politely declines them he politely declines them because he is already settled where he is in an alien country he gets paid pretty well and he doesn't feel like leaving that job for the sake of homeland and then his wife and children are admired by his relatives because they are uh, from the foreign land and they have money and prestige and power and everything and that they are tourists for the time being in their homeland and they bring a uh, uh, you know a neck tie to give to everybody because they are not going to meet them again they are meeting them for the first time and they won't be meeting them again and uh, after doing all these honors in the four weeks time dr kanna delivers his final talk at a college in his former hometown <laughs> and as he delivers the final talk as you would have seen in that video mr radhe mohan who is a court seller a court stamp seller who is also by the way his father's friend happens to come to the stage and he forces himself into a monologue and that monologue is really touching uh, the question is is it dr I mean, is it mr radhe mohan's monologue or is he being a foil to his father is he being an alter ego of his father right so that's not part of the narration if you if you read uh, the study material or if you read the short story you may not come across this reference yeah you may not come across this reference but after you read the story if you go back to this uh, we we may make as as readers of literature we may make such interesting observations as to what these interior monologues really are uh and we may sometimes feel that radhe mohan is actually being the mouthpiece of uh <coughs> i'm sorry uh, dr kanna's father whose name is kundan lal and uh, when we hear the initial when when we read through the initial part of the story we would find reverence for dr kanna's accomplishments and we and we may not be taken aback or we won't, we won't really have a wonder that he is giving these many lectures he has been revered by everybody and uh, even the uh, president and the prime minister are meeting him and offering positions but then when we hear dr Ra mr radhe mohan's account i'm sorry not doctor mr radhe mohan's account we feel so empathetic towards dr kanna's father dr kanna's father <coughs> is typical of any other uh, i'm sorry uh, is typical of any other uh, father from a village whose son has migrated to a foreign land 
So he's quite boastful. He's rather quite happy about his son's accomplishments. He, he takes immense pride in the fact that his son has traveled abroad and he's the only one from the village. And even when probably he does not really come back from uh, the foreign land, uh, Kundanlal tries to uh, you know, be optimistic and he reminds the villagers that his son is the only person to have gone to America, the only villager from here to have gone to America. Initially, he believed that his son would come back and marry from India. But even when his son marries from America, Kundan nurtures the hope that he'll come back and take him to America at some point of time. And uh, Radhe Mohan comes across this because he sees Kundan shaving at least uh, on, almost on a daily basis. And he's bought two new shirts and a suit, suit in order to meet the current status or prestige of his son. So see how proud and how celebratory and how rejoiced a father Kundanlal is. So despite his long waitings, Dr. Kanna doesn't come back. And even when his father, even the news reaches that his father is in his deathbed, uh, Kundan says, uh, sorry, Dr. Kanna says that he cannot come back because he has to attend a conference. So sometimes, uh, I mean, the story was written long back, but we can see quite a lot of parallels even today. I, I know someone from my own family in a distant relation. I know someone, uh, uh, one of my uh, relatives had a son and uh, a daughter. And the son migrated to United Kingdom and he married and he never returned. Even when his mother died, uh, that too of an accident, he never returned. So this is something that is extremely relatable. And uh, we spoke about Ruskin Bond and how uh, tales for children can give us morals. But sometimes even stories this heart touching like that of Arun Joshi's can also awake us to some new realities. So I would uh, urge you to read that story if you may. Uh, I understand that along with the blocks that you get, you may get an entire compilation of all these short stories as well. So if you have got that book, please go through the short story. It is an amazing read. Even though you don't have annotations, please read uh, Radhe Mohan's monologue. You could even try enacting it. It is an exceptional piece, just in case you haven't read it. The way in which, you know, we must also think about that. I said he's being the mouthpiece of Kundan Lal, or maybe it is Kundan Lal's interior monologue and all. But take it from a very uh, alienistic way. We are, we are talking about alienation. So let's take it from Dr. Kanna's way. A son doesn't even want to be bothered about his father. Just an acquaintance of his father. See what Radhe Shyam does to Kundanda or to his son. He's nobody to me. Even his son doesn't want him. Even his son doesn't bother about him. But then Radhe Shyam goes to the extent of delivering a, an extremely emotional monologue, remembering the struggles of Kundanlal, the pride that he had for his son, like every father does, and the you know unjustifiable end that Kundanlal met because of uh, his son, Dr. Karna's negligence. Before we conclude and move on to R.K. Narayan, this also throws light to, this also throws light to what? the so-called American dream. There are quite a lot of stories and poems which criticize or take American dream to the uh, challenging space. But then this is one such story which challenges the American dream. Just in case you don't know, that's another word that you may Google for the theoretical point of view. So the American dream. So we have this term in American literature. Yes, you have. If you have opted for that paper, yes, it is there in your American literature paper. It is a term coined by James Truslow Adams in 1931. And uh, it actually meant what America used to represent. Equality of opportunities for everyone. We cannot completely critique American dream because we know that so the West was divided up to a certain point on the basis of color racism. And when we come to India, 
we were segregated on the basis of caste. So that's why you have paper like MEG 30, writings from the margins, <coughs> or tribal literature, folk literatures in India, MEG 16. So we were divided by caste and they were divided by color. And in such a scenario, and when, when, we, when we speak about Britain, when you come to British novel, and when you talk about the rise of the novel, <coughs> you realize that the Britishers were a high class society. They had this class hierarchy and the social climbing was very limited. If you are born to a high class, you would die a high class. But if you were, if you were, if you were born poor, chances are high that you would die poor and starve and victimized. So over the due course of time, also thanks to the inception of democracy, the fall of autocratic regimes and fascist regimes, we could see that uh, uh, equality became a catchword. And uh, American dream emphasizes on that equality or that upward social climbing mobility. American dream claims that if you are talented enough, irrespective of whether you are the son of a carpenter or the son of a president, <coughs> you can escalate to any positions in the country. Again, it is theoretical. There could be uh, lobbying and other politics that would still prevent you from <coughs> such a progress. But nonetheless, regardless of which class, race or time that you are born to, you can or you will have equal opportunities is what the American dream promises. So if you look at the story, the only American from our village, you would see that it is a take on the materialistic uh, sentiments of the West. Again, I repeat that term, materialism. Materialism is where, uh, yes, precisely, to all, all my sons by other men. So precisely, uh, materialism is where you, you lay emphasis to materialistic gains by avoiding or by ignoring your emotional requirements. For instance, you may end up working from Monday to Sunday, nine to five, in order to make money. And you may not give due attention to your parents or your wife or your children. And in turn, by the time you make enough money, you may end up losing them to <coughs> sorry, something or the other. So that's materialism for you. And you could see that in Arun Joshi's story, uh, Dr. Kanna is a victim of materialism or the American dream. Having migrated, what would have made him migrate to America? Yes, we can say that maybe our country was insufficient enough to give avenues or outlets for his talent here. Maybe he would not have been paid as much as they pay him there. But still, he migrated to America by looking at the green pastures out there he probably would have abhorred or hated his homeland. He migrated to America. He married an American lady, probably again for the green card or other privileges. <laughs> I'm sorry, the other privileges that would come along with it. And uh, then he has children there. He works in a university there. And he is comfortably positioned over there. And unlike many other children who migrate to America and get back to their family and maybe take their parents for a tour, he entirely turns a blind eye. He gives a, an absolute cold response to Kundan Lal's paternal love for him. He never realizes that perhaps. I think up and until, <coughs> sorry, up and until Radesham, uh, mentions this in his monologue, Dr. Kanna never reflects, never looks back at himself and uh, never realizes the sort of love that his father had for him. That's why he has to later consult a psychiatrist. He's no longer the same self. He is full of guilt and shame. He's not able to reciprocate, reciprocate the filial love that his father had for him. So before we proceed to all that, I'd like to give you a couple of references just in case Arun Joshi short story comes for your analysis for the exam, then you may use these references uh, as required. So one such reference is a short story by Anita Desai called A Devoted Son. A Devoted 
son by Anita Desai. So that's one short story that you may have a look at. Uh, just due to the shortage of time, I can just give you some important points regarding that short story. Uh, Anita Desai's devoted son, um, I think, yeah, it's Rakesh. I, I thought Rajesh, okay. So it has as its, as its protagonist a character called Rakesh. The title refers to Rakesh. So Rakesh goes abroad and uh, he becomes a doctor, if I remember correctly. And uh, the people in the street try to enlighten his parents that he may end up marrying a foreigner and he'll never come back. But popular to their misconceptions, Rakesh comes back. So not only that he comes back, but he comes back as a bachelor. He does not marry a foreigner. He tops the exams. He becomes a doctor and he urges and he marries uh, a comparatively uneducated village girl that his mother had found for him. But the story takes a twist when his mother passes away and his father ages. And because his father has a lot of diseases, including diabetes, the son, who is now a doctor, starts imposing restrictions on his father. And his father really feels frustrated. And a tussle between the father and the son, the son to make sure his father lives longer. And for him and others, it is taking care of the father, a devoted son. But for the father, it is hell. He, he feels like if he is dead. So it is an, it is an amazing read. And uh, a good contract, a good comparative read with uh, Arun Joshi's short story as well, because in Arun Joshi's short story we have a story, we have a uh, protagonist who has completely uh, negated his father. Here we have a son who has returned to his father, but has created hell for him by being uh, so devoted to. Him. Again, just to give you insights into multiculturalism, the term multiculturalism, I have two more interesting references for you. Both are poems, not short stories, though. One is at the Lahore Karhai. Karhai, it's a restaurant in uh, London. So at the Lahore Karhai, a poem by uh, Intias Darkar. Intias Darkar. It's Lahore, not Lahore. I'm sorry for that spelling. It's L A H O R E. At the Lahore Karani. And another poem is Indian movie New Jersey by Chitra Banerjee Divakar. Chitra Banerjee Divakar. It's quite a long name. Okay. So, uh, it's available in the web. You may go back and have a look at this. Indian movie New Jersey in particular discusses this contradiction between uh, the, you know, the, the, the traditional generation and the new youngsters and how this multiculturalism takes place. At the Lahore Karai is a place where people from different countries, the migrants from different countries meet at a restaurant <coughs> and uh, nostalgically yearn for their desi cuisines. All right. So these are two references that I have regarding Arun Joshi's short story. So, I would like to add something. Yes, go on, Shwani. Yes, sir. So here's a line now that his wife and children were worshipped by his relatives whom they had never ever met before. So yeah. this line just uh, like I had written something on Kota Factory like uh, there had been students who have been suiciding. So here, it also this uh, uh, short story also shows us the opposite side of the society. That in this uh, play, sh short story, we can see that the society awards the winners, but it never takes uh, what to say. Like they never care about the people who have failed in their lives. Like they are always uh, too, they are they are not even considering that Mr. Khanna, Doctor Khanna has never worried about his father. They don't care. They are just happy that he's successful. अब वो लोग अपने रिश्तेदार को बोल सकते हैं ना अरे हमारा भतीजा ये किया है वो किया है. So we, the society leader teaches us how to deal with failure and never shows us that we must accept failure. This is the loophole we can see in the society. Indeed, indeed. Uh, that's quite a pertinent observation. Thank you for that. Uh, because, uh, you know, when we discuss certain things, we may miss out some loose ends. So that's one such loose ends in that short story. 
uh, when Dr. Kanna comes back home, when the story begins, when he comes back to his village, uh, his relatives are so warm and welcoming. Uh, they don't really, th I mean, as a matter of fact, they are the people who should have voiced for Kundan Lal instead of uh, Radesha. But then they don't do that. They are rather happy to, to, to conveniently forget all those things and to live in the present. Sir, I think these are char log. Kya these are those char log. <laughs> ha, so to, to live in the present and to accept the presence from Dr. Khan. That is their presence of mind. So yeah, a little bit of word pun. Thank you for that. So to live in the present and to accept the presence and uh, acknowledge his presence. And that's what they do. So that's another thing that you can uh, observe as well. Let's very quickly move on to uh, R.K. Narayan. R.K. Narayan needs no introduction. I have given enough introductions already about R.K. Narayan. Even otherwise, you would have come across him during your school days, college days. <laughs> Malgudi days, needless to say, is a literary classic. Then Swami and his friends. There are quite a lot of short stories written by R.K. Narayan that you may have come across, um, which I don't want to waste our time because we have two short stories uh, prescribed to deal with. So just breaking the order in your study material, I'm straight away going to the second one because I played a short video a little while ago. So there is this short story by R.K. Narayan prescribed to you titled Engine Trouble. And then you also have another short story uh, by R.K. Narayan uh, prescribed for your study. And uh, that story is of a saint and it's called An Astrologer's Day. It's about an astrologer, in fact. So these two stories we'll deal with in the next, let's say, almost 60, 65 minutes. And uh, to begin with, I begin with engine trouble. Before going directly to the story, again, a little bit of a cross-reference. Yesterday, I spoke to you about how short story expanded in America. I spoke about the exponents of America, uh, short story in America, like Edgar Allan Poe, Mark Twain, um, the Nathaniel Horton and uh, O. Henry. I told you that, or I reminded you that O. Henry short stories are known for its twists. So these two stories prescribed for your study, an astrologer's day and engine trouble, are in a way reminiscent of O. Henry's narratology. We could see O. Henry's uh, influence in R.K. Narayan's creature. So let's begin with Engine Trouble. Engine Trouble would be a story known to you if you have been through Malgudi days, or if you have seen Katamita, or if you have seen that movie starring Mohanlal and uh, Kudravatambha. So, yeah. So in that short story, when the story begins, there is a fail. So Jabam Mele Me Jate, when we go for these Ulsavams, what happens is there would be a stall where we could pay 10 rupee, 20 rupee, get a few rings to throw at, and uh, if we are lucky, we may end up winning something. So our protagonist in the story goes to a mela, a fair, and uh, the narrator wins a lot, a jackpot. He had purchased a ticket. The number of a ticket is 1005, not that it's significant. But nonetheless, the narrator wins the lottery. And as a gift, he wins a road engine, or what you may call as a road roller. It may sound bizarre, but that's how stories are. I mean, you may ask who on earth gives you a road engine. There could be car, there could be bike, there could be something else. So why a road engine? Well, the question is pertinent, <coughs> but then I'm not sure about why. Uh, a road engine is selected, maybe because of you know the subtle humor that follows in the story. So R.K. Narayan, in the story, in his, his narrator goes to a fair and he wins a lottery and he wins a road roller. But it's literally like in Malayalam we say Potran lottery. So Potran lottery is a road roller. Our road roller is not rich enough. He is a medial man. He uh, struggles to meet his both ends. And um, he is quite lucky that he has received a road roll. 
as a gift. But the problem is, the road runner is placed in the ground where the fair is being conducted. And how to transport this road roller from that place? So they already tell him that he has to take that road roller from the ground. He seeks time and uh, the organizer give, grants him time until the mela gets over. So the organizer tells him that, okay, there are 12 to 15 days by the time this mela will come to an end. So until then I'll keep it here, but after that you have to take this. So the bichara tries to uh, get this out of that uh, ground. So he goes to almost, uh, he does almost everything. So um, he was told that you know the rent to be paid to the municipality, if this has to be kept in the Gymkhana ground where the fair is happening. So he has to pledge his wife's jewels to uh, pay this rent. And then uh, they keep this for uh, up until the fair is over. But then once this fair is over, that's what happens in ground. So one fair is over, the another fair gets it. So there was a cattle show that should follow this fair. So they tell him that there would be a cattle show in the Gymkhana grounds. So the municipality urged him to take the road roller away from the grounds at the earliest. So the narrator becomes quite desperate. So he by now had found a field which was owned by his friend and he thought that he will keep this in his friend's field for a few days. <coughs> but again he was, la he was lacking the manpower to transport the road engine from the Gymkhana ground to the friend's land. So he, he tried to meet every bus driver whom he met and he asked them to help him transport this from one place to another. In the meanwhile, he comes across a temple priest who, out of sheer kindness, consents to lend him the temple elephant. Remember, he consents to give the temple elephant to our narrator to make sure that the road engine or the road roller is transported. But again, it cannot be done by the elephant alone. So he somehow, see, he somehow accumulates some money and he brings 50 people, 50 manual laborers to push the road roller along with the elephant. But that alone won't do. Somebody has to drive the road roller. So he again seeks help of one Mr. Joseph who was allegedly suspended. He was a bus driver. He was suspended for some, but because our narrator doesn't have any other option or alternative, he requests Joseph to intervene. And that is the video that I played to you. If you listen to that video carefully, the character played by Kudravatan Patti, he claims that he has done this several times before. And he says that there is no space, it's a narrow space through which he drove the roller once and it could go and crash anywhere. So he was confused because he was not getting the brake and it could fall anywhere. So in the middle of his boastfulness, he is leaving hints that he crashes the vehicle. But nonetheless, he go on to explain that even in such a slope, he was able to uh, victoriously drive this home. But contrary to his boastful stories, when it comes to the actual situation, he climbs on top of the uh, engine and he is unable to start the engine. He is trying to start the road roller, but then he is unable to. Then somehow these 50 people, the schoolies, decide to push this along with the elephant who is tied, tied with strong ropes. And uh, quite a lot of people assembled to watch this spectacle as well. Because this now, by now has become <coughs> a public area of interest. Everybody wants to have a look at this giant circus. So the entire people had assembled to have a look at this. 
so the 50 coolies try to push the road roller along with the elephant and then what happens and then when the road and road roller reached the road it was okay but then the elephant took the road engine in one direction and joseph moved the steering erratically and the 50 coolies pushed it in a different manner so as a result the road engine crashes into the wall compound opposite to the ground and uh, it created panic so the elephant started to run amok so the coolies ran to different ways the police came into the scene and they arrested the narrator after a few days he was released from the lockup but then he had been charged of several things so he had to repair the several yards of the wall he had to pay the remuneration of the 50 coolies he had to pay the fee to joseph if despite the fact that he had failed to keep the engine under the control he had to provide medicine for the injured knee of the temple elephant and uh, the authority meanwhile would not listen to him no matter what <laughs> <laughs> so by now the narrator had become a laughing stock in this town he decided to send his wife to his in-laws place by leaving the town and uh, at this time again just as a part of a comic relief a swamiji appeared in malgudi and he started to show magical activities so he and his assistants claimed that he could run a road roller over him he claims that he could even drink poison and remain alive nonetheless our narrator was so happy that at least in this way if he could drive the roller coaster away sorry roll roller away it would be better no road roller right roll roller okay happens road roll so the road roller away so the narrator was happy if it happens this way then better but then again the police intervened and uh, and asked the Swamiji not to take any such risky deeds. So our narrator was left absolutely clueless. But this is where, like O. Henry's short stories, a twist occurs. The narrator is saved by natural forces. Probably God's listening to his midnight prayers. An earthquake happens exactly in that location. And it so happens that the road roller falls into an old well. Again, our narrator got afraid that he'll have to pay for that damage as well. But luckily, that old well was deemed as a nuisance by the municipality. They were urging its owner to close the well. But the owner was not able to do that again that will incur additional expenses the owner of the well or the land that had the well was not as rich either so to his fortune and to the narrator's fortune the road roller fell exactly on top of the well that too upside down so now it formed the shape of a cork that closes a bottle so the the owner of that land urged the narrator to not remove that road roller at all now a narrator who had from the beginning of the story fallen into a desolate helpless state starts taking some airs he claims that no 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 i'll have to get it out of it i have to uh, manage a lot of expenses and so on and so forth and the owner of the land agrees to pay off all the debts and charges against a narrator he pays for the injured, he pays for the temple elephant's knee, he pays Joseph, he pays the municipality. And he makes sure that no cases remain on a narrator. And thus, the story comes to a happy ending. We say, all is well that ends well. So by now, 
the story comes to a happy climax. A happy climax where we have the narrator who at the beginning was poor, had no fortunes, goes to a fair, wins a lottery, wins a road roller, and falls into miseries of all sorts. By the end of the story, a turn of events, we have the road roller falling on top upside down of a well, an unused well, <laughs> and uh, its owner pays for his damages and uh, saves him from the trouble of the lottery that he won. Before we proceed to the next story, a few more cross-references and uh, thought-provoking uh, scenarios to you. When the story begins, the narrator, as I've already told you, is in hunt of his fortunes. And for a commoner, an instant way to get some quick buck is called winning lottery. So you may have all read this short story by Anton Chekhov. What's the name of that short story that you have read during your school days? Where a couple dream of winning a lottery? The name of that short story is The Lottery Ticket. So Anton Chekhov <coughs> has spent a story called The Lottery Ticket and it deals with a couple, if I remember correctly, Ivan and Martha. Ivan and Martha, <coughs> I'm sorry, buying a lottery ticket and they both dream what they would do if they buy a lottery. So without winning the lottery, the couple get into a spat. The otherwise loving, happily living couple gets into a fight. So the husband says, I'll do this and this when I get a lottery. The wife says, no, 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 I have to do this and this and this when we win a lottery. So by the end, they realize that they are fighting unnecessarily because they have still not won the lottery ticket and uh, they fall into despair. Like I gave you a devoted son in contrast to Arun Joshi's short story. Now consider this in contrast to R.K. Narayan's short story. Right? This particular story, the lottery ticket, you have two protagonists who have who dream of winning a lottery and they fight. In Engine Trouble, you have a protagonist, a narrator, a single narrator, who goes in search of fortunes, hits the jackpot. That's the best, that's the irony about it. He hits the jackpot, but the jackpot is of no use to him. It rather brings him to the verge of um, a huge backlash. But somehow, due to another fortune or a misfortune, I don't know how you call an earthquake, he comes out of it and somehow, as in O. Henry's short stories, all swell that ends well, we have a happy ending where everyone, including the narrator, <coughs> get an amicable solution to the problem. So that's just a sample of R.K. Narayan's storytelling. Now, let me take you to another short story by R.K. Narayan. So a little while ago, I think Rashmi Goelji had already shared the link of, uh, perhaps she had shared two links, one of Malgudi Days and uh, the other one of the story that I'm going to deal with called Astrologer's Day. That link consists of a short of a depiction of that short story, 23 minutes long. So I'm not going to venture out to play 23 minute video. But I'm playing this videos before the narration because you get a basic idea and I can build on that idea. I could do the other way around as well to conceal the suspense. But for the time being, because you've been listening to my lecture for a long while now, as a comic relief, let me share my screen and take you to an animated narrative of the next short story, An Astrologer's Day. 
The story begins at midday when the astrologer is seated under a tamarind tree in the town hall park. He spread out his professional equipment which consisted of a dozen cowrie shells, a square piece of cloth with obscure mystic charts on it, a notebook and a bundle of palmyra writing. He wore a saffron turban around his head. His eyes sparkled with a sharp abnormal gleam and his forehead was covered with sacred ash and vermilion. This color combination never failed to attract people to him. A variety of tradesmen attracted people in the park. There were medicine sellers, sellers of stolen hardware and junk, magicians, and also an auctioneer of cheap cloth. Next to the astrologer was also a vendor of fried groundnuts who gave his wear a fancy name each day like Bombay Ice Cream, Delhi Almond and Raja's Delicacy. A lot of people who flocked to him also dallied before the astrologer. There was no municipal lighting in the region. A bewildering crisscross of light rays and moving shadows suited the astrologer because he was not a real astrologer. He was as much a stranger to the stars as were his innocent customers. He had left his ancestral home in the village many years ago without telling anyone. And although he was not a real astrologer, he had a working analysis of mankind's troubles like marriage, money and the tangles of human ties. He allowed the customers to speak for at least 10 minutes without saying anything. And then he would gaze at the customer's palm and say, In many ways you are not getting the fullest results for your efforts. Most people agreed with him. Or he questioned, Is there a woman in your family, maybe even a distant relative, who is not well disposed towards you? You have an impetuous nature and a rough exterior. This endeared him to their hearts immediately because even the mildest of humans like to think that they have forbidding exterior. The nuts vendor blew out his flame and then the astrologer began to bundle up his things because now he was in darkness except for a little shaft of green light which strayed in from somewhere and touched the ground before him. He was packing his bag when the green shaft of light was blotted out. He looked up and saw a man standing before him. He sensed a possible client and said, You look so careworn. It will do you good to sit down for a while and chat with me. The other grumbled some vague reply. The astrologer pressed his invitation and the man thrust his palm under his nose and said, You call yourself an astrologer? The astrologer felt challenged. He tilted the man's palm towards the green shaft of light and said, Yours is a nature... Oh, stop that, the man said. Tell me something worthwhile. The astrologer was annoyed. I charge only three pies per question and what you get ought to be good enough for your money. At this, the man withdrew his arm, took out an anna and flung it to him saying, I have some questions to ask. If I prove you are bluffing, you must return that anna to me with interest. If you find my answer satisfactory, will you give me five rupees? No. Or will you give me eight annas? All right, provided you give me twice as much if you are wrong, said the stranger. This pact was accepted after a little argument. The astrologer sent up a prayer to heaven as the other lit a cheroot. The astrologer caught a glimpse of his face by the matchlight. There was a pause. The man sat down, sucking his chair root, puffing out. He sat there ruthlessly.
the astrologer felt very uncomfortable. Here, take your Anna back. I'm not used to such challenges. It is late for me today. He prepared to bundle up. The other man held his wrist and said, You can't get out of it now. You dragged me in while I was passing. The astrologer shivered in his grip. His voice shook and became faint. Leave me today. I will speak to you tomorrow. The other thrust his palm in his face and said, Challenge is challenge. Go on. The astrologer proceeded with his throat drying up. There is a woman. Stop, said the man. I don't want all that. Shall I succeed in my present search or not? Answer this and go. Otherwise, I will not let you go till you disgorge all your coins. The astrologer muttered a few incantations and replied, All right, I will speak. But will you give me a rupee if what I say is convincing? Otherwise, I will not open my mouth and you may do what you like. After a good deal of haggling, the other man agreed. The astrologer said, You were left for dead. Am I right? Ah, tell me more. A knife has passed through you once, said the astrologer. Good fellow! What else? And then you were pushed into a well nearby in the field. You were left for dead. I should have been dead if some passerby had not chanced to peep into the well, exclaimed the man, overwhelmed by enthusiasm. When shall I get at him? he asked, clenching his fist. In the next world, answered the astrologer. He died four months ago in a far-off town. You will never see any more of him. The other groaned on hearing it. The astrologer proceeded. Guru Nayak. You know my name? said the other, taken aback. As I know all other things, Guru Nayak, listen carefully to what I have to say. Your village is two days' journey due north of this town. Take the next train and be gone. I see once again great danger to your life if you go from home. He took out a pinch of sacred ash and held it out to him. Rub it on your forehead and go home. Never travel southward again and you will live to be a hundred. Why should I leave home again? The man said reflectively. I was only going away now and then to look for him and to choke out his life if I met him. Guru Nayak shook his head regretfully. He has escaped my hands. I hope at least he died as he deserved. Yes, said the astrologer. He was crushed under a lorry. Guru Nayak looked gratified to hear it. The place was deserted by the time the astrologer picked up his articles and put them into his bag. The green sh Well, that's not the end of the narration. I'll play the remaining part in a while from now. But I just thought I'll hold the suspense just in case you haven't read the blocks or the story yet. So just to recap what happened so far. The astrologer, as we are told in the story, was not an astrologer right away. He had actually eloped from his village and by chance he happened to be an astrologer. So he knew the art of trickery. So he had put in a saffron turban or a cloth and he had put in uh, this white, uh, what do you call as basma and he pretended to be someone who knows astrology. The trade was pretty easy for him. He would sit there and any bond passes by, he would like to hoax them by saying, this world has been so unfair to you. This 
is still a universal catch. If someone comes to me and say, this world has been unfair to you, I may fall for it. Because sometimes, no matter how prepared and how dedicated we take classes, there would be one chap somewhere who would still say, we didn't understand a word you said. Or there would be one fellow who would go and complain saying, okay, he didn't complete the portions or he didn't give us the notes or any X, Y, Z company. And then we would feel like, oh God, this world is being so tough on us. And then there is nobody who is really properly honoring us for giving good lectures. Just for example, all right. The same can be said from your side. If someone tells you this world doesn't serve you uh, justly, you may fall for it because you try to do all that you can and still maybe your teacher do not give you the marks that you deserve. Maybe you fail for your exams <laughs> or people do not appreciate what you do in your life, in your workplace. Yesterday, someone was talking about how her brother's song was not accepted. Uh, was not accepted by the public, for instance. So there could be such unexpected setbacks in all our lives. This is commonly applicable to all of us. Nobody runs, I mean, no fairy comes into our life and says, uh, Zoom Baba, your life is great. Or no, uh, what do you call, GD comes to our life like it did in Aladdin's life. So that is this astrologer turned fraud's trick. He meets people, he tells them the world or this life has been unfair to you and they fall for it. So they come and sit to, in front of him and then he does all the sort of you know body language gimmicks and he stays silent for at least 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm sorry. 10 minutes of silence indicates that there is some further trouble coming up your way. And then he says, some mishap is going to happen to you. And if, you, if that should not happen, you should do this, you should do that. And eventually, he'll get paid by these people. So this is the trick that he had been doing for a long time. But on that particular day, years later, let's say 20 or 10, 15 years later, since he started this job, he's married in the new city, he's got a family. And then he, he uh, one fine day after his work, he's about to leave. The street is almost dark. He gets the light from a nearby street vendor. So even he's closing the shop and he's about to leave. But such is greed. Sometimes when we get sufficient, we won't feel it to be sufficient. We feel like, okay, let me take one more. So he saw a man and he felt hooked to invite him for a forecast. So he started a conversation but the particular guy was not interested in vague, loose conversations. He was very precise. He said, I will listen to you and I'll pay to you if you give me conclusive answers, if you give me precise answers. Do not bluff around. Give me the answers that I'm looking for. And then I shall reciprocate you. Well, on that note, our astrologer started packing his bags. Because the street vendor had turned his light off and kerosene light off and had walked off. The street was dark. And this guy did not seem to fall for his charms. He doesn't have any solid statements to give the mind. So then he said, okay, I'm not giving you this forecast. I'm winding up. I'm calling it a day. Just then, a narrator lighted, or rather lit, a cigarette, a flame. And he saw the narrator's face. And then, our astrologer sat down and he said, okay, I'll give you the solutions. I'll give you whatever you want to hear. So this, they engaged in a conversation and to everyone's surprise, I say everyone because we are also spectators there. We are listening to what the astrologer is talking to the guy. And he, unlike the bluffing that he was doing up until then, he was revealing all the so-called hideous things of his life. And he was telling that the person you, are, you have come in search of died in a crash. He is no more. 
you were stabbed by that person a few years ago and you also fell in the well. And he resorts by say, retorts by saying that, yes, yes, I fell into the well. I would have almost died. It is a passerby who saved me. Otherwise, I would have died. And I'm craving to take revenge. And then astrologer tells him that that person is already dead. He died in a car crash. And uh, if <laughs> the times are not good for you right now, so if you continue to wander around, you may also meet the same end. So please go back to your village and do not come out of it. And he also identifies the person by his name. And he tells him, Guru Nayak, please go back to your village. At which the, 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 the person is surprised. You know my name too, so you must be a real visionary. And then Guru Nayak promises that he'll go back home and he'll never go out of his village. Also because he no longer have a motive to go out of his village because the person whom he seeks to take revenge is no more. He's, die, he's dead in a, cra a car crash. Hopefully, maybe by now you would have understood what the suspense is. But then let me continue with that video and I'll come back and break the twist or discuss the twist after the video is come. Shaft was also gone, leaving Raja picked up his article gratified to hear it. The place was deserted by the time the astrologer picked up his articles and put them into his bag. The green shaft was also gone, leaving the place in darkness and silence. The stranger had gone off into the night, leaving the astrologer with a handful of coins. It was nearly midnight when the astrologer reached home. His wife was waiting for him at the door and demanded an explanation. He flung the coins at her and said, Count them. One man gave all that. Twelve and a half an hour, she said, counting. She was overjoyed. I can buy some jaggery and coconut tomorrow. The child has been asking for sweets for so many days now. I will prepare some nice stuff for her. The swine has cheated me. He promised me a rupee, said the astrologer. She looked up at him. You look worried. What is wrong? Nothing. After dinner, sitting on the pyol, he told her, Do you know a great load has gone from me today? I thought I had the blood of a man on my hands all these years. That was the reason why I ran away from home, settled here and married you. He is alive. She gasped. You tried to kill? Yes, in our village, when I was a silly youngster, we drank, gambled and quarreled badly one day. Why think of it now? Time to sleep, he said, yawning, and stretched himself on the pure. Thus, R.K. Narayan presents to us a story with atmosphere, characterization, suspense. Now you see the twist, don't you? Our astrologer was himself the person who had tried to kill Guru Nayak. But then he thought Guru Nayak is dead and that's why he eloped from his village, came and had a forged identity of an astrologer. But the moment he sees that Guru Nayak is alive, out of the desire to stay alive, he craftfully or rather cunningly or cleverly uses the situation to his merit and fakes Guru Nayak that that particular person is no more and convinces him to go back to his village. Guru Nayak too has not really fulfilled his promise. He gave only 12 anas in the place of one rupee to the astrologer. But nevertheless, I'm sure, unlike the mood that was shown in the dimension video, I'm sure the astrologer would have been far more relieved that he's got something much priceless that, than, than that one rupee. That is his life. And that he could live with his family for a lifetime. So that is the twist that R.K. Narayan brings forth in this tale. And let me also give you one more parallel uh, regarding uh, this narratology. I'm not sure whether, I, I, I'm not sure if R.K. Sure R.K. Narayan got inspired by O. Henry in this matter. 
but then I could see that I could see a strong parallel between a story written by O. Henry and R. K. Narayan, though not in the same way. There is the story by O. Henry titled After 23 Years or After 20 Years. I don't remember the exact title. I think it's After 20 Years. So the, the story happens in America where there are two friends in a village. And uh, let's say 20 years back, a friend has gone to Boston in search of uh, fortunes. So let's say, I'm just giving a tentative name. Let's say it's Jack and James. So Jack has gone to Boston to make money. He invited James to accompany him, but James said, no, no, I'll be here and I'll try to make a life better. So they had promised because they were thick friends. They promised that wherever they are, whether they become rich or poor, or poor they'll meet after 20 years under the same street light at a particular time after 20 years. So today is that day, 20 years since they parted. Well, we know how a city or a, or, a, or a locality changes in 20 years. So in 2023, if I say that the street light remains there, that should be a miracle. But nonetheless, there is no question for story. So everything happens. So everything is taken for granted. So in that story, when the story begins, Jack is waiting under the street lamp. And a young man arrives and they have a conversation. And Jack tells him that he had a friend called James and that they had parted ways and he had invited James, but James being uh, so-called Ulu Kapata, who is who's not sensible enough to come for rich or to take risks for being rich. He continued to stay in the stupid village. And uh, I have gone out and I've made a huge amount and I'm back now. And I hope that guy is still poor and I'm here to make him rich. While saying this, the narrator, Jack, lit a cigarette and the, the person who came also asks for the light and he matches his cigar as well. So the person who came and listened to all the stories wished him good luck and uh, told him that may you be able to meet your friends 20 years later. And uh, he took leave. He, he left the place. A few minutes later, a young gentleman came to Jack and introduced himself as James. But within a few seconds, Jack realizes that it is not James. So he yells at him and asks him who he is and tells him that you cannot be my friend James. Even though it's 20 years, I know how James would be like. To which the one who came responds saying, Mr. Jack, you are under arrest. You are right, I am not James. James was the one who came a little while ago and you had a conversation with. While you lit up the cigarette, he saw your face, just like the astrologer saw the face of Guru Naik. <laughs> and he realized that you are the most wanted criminal in Boston. So being your childhood friend, James could not muster courage to arrest you. So he sent me a sub-inspector to hold you in prison. So that's how after 20 years ends. We can see a strong parallel in uh, this story by R.K. Narayan. As you may have observed, R.K. Narayan's stories take real life scenarios into consideration. When we speak about the plot construction. It is commonplace. We all know, just like Ruskin Bond uses Masuri or Daradun, Arke Narayan goes back to Malgud. But it does not end there. He also very skillfully uses the day-to-day -day scenarios that he saw in India. So in this particular story, it's needless to say, one thing that sells in India is astrology. We have quite a lot of fake saints, gurus, and uh, um, we have people who sell religion and uh, 
astrology is something that sells like hotcakes. So R.K. Narayan wanted to take a dig at such a scenario, but he does not venture deep into the superstitious beliefs and what happens to people who listen to these astrologers. No, not in this story. There are stories though that he explores these aspects, but here his focus is on what happens to an astrologer, a fake astrologer like this, when he meets death to his face. So we see R.K. Narayan engaging in his typical rural style, rustic style, bringing in iron, situational irony, and showing how um, our dear Guru Naik is convinced by the astrologer and how he cleverly uh, diverts Yam Dev that paid a visit to him. Thus, R.K. Narayan convinces our narrators that we have to be actually cautious to such superstitious, fraudulent people. Even today, we come across quite a lot of such fraudulent people and uh, people who resort to uh, black magic and witchcraft and uh, so many other things. Unlike the other days, I had forgotten to share these links instantaneously. So I'm just sharing them one by one. So you may have a look at this. These are easily available in the web domains. You don't really need me to take you to these links. But nonetheless, I'm sharing this link for your perusal. So you have an astrologer's day, you have engine trouble, <coughs> and also Arun Joshi's tail, the only American from our village. And I'd also like to share this particular article, which may also come to your rescue if required. And I hope these three in itself are too much for the day. I'm not sure if you have room for any further tales today. So am I. My throat does not permit me to indulge in further animated narrations. Generally, when I deal with Astrologer's Day, I, I am a little bit more animated. I try to pretend like a you know, garb clothed astrologer, try to put in the Tika stuff and try to pretend and enact those scenarios. So somehow, uh, my health didn't let me do that today. But nonetheless, I hope you found it to be informative. I hope I was able to give you that sort of a... Tomorrow we'll deal with the two feministic stories and if you have time, let me see what else can I uh, move on. Tomorrow we'll deal with uh, the fourth daughter and a toast to herself. I'm not sure if we'll get time for another story. If we get time, maybe miracle or even there is one more story that i missed out a trip into the jungle before reading a trip into the jungle if possible try to read the lord of the flies by william golding i think i told you the other day the lord of the flies by william golding it would be an interesting parallel read with the lord of flies and a trip into the jungle by manoj das yes Yes, I was asking to tell about the themes of this of this short story theme. I have already done that, haven't I? Uh, no, no, no. There, there is one theme like identity, you know. So, what? How is that identity related? Like guilt, fear, and identity. Uh, which, which, which short story? Astrologer's Day, sir. Okay. Uh, see, it's it's not only about Astrologer's Day. Even in the in the short story by. Uh, you know, the, 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 what was that name? Yeah, um, the, on, the only American from our village by Arun Joshi. You could see the theme, <laughs> though from an alienation perspective. <laughs> I'm sorry, just give me a second. <laughs> so what happens? When the story opens, we see that somebody is an astrologer. How does someone become an astrologer in India? Generally, someone becomes an astrologer because people in his family are astrologers. They are astrologers on the basis of their caste, or he or she has learned astrology. These are the three premises under which somebody becomes an astrologer in India. But our protagonist 
is not an astrologer because of these factors. He had eloped from his village for some reasons that's not revealed in the beginning. I'm sorry. So he comes to another land and he becomes, or rather he feigns the identity of an astrologer. So in that pretext, is that his real identity? No. It is a feigned identity in order to survive. Had he been there in the village, he would have tilled the soil or he would have done some menial jobs. He would have continued to be a daily laborer perhaps. But because he has come to another town and he needs to survive, he takes up the job of an astrologer. Again, it's a cunning choice. It's not a straightforward direct thought that, okay, I'll become an astrologer. It is again another part of an evil mind. He decides to be an astrologer because he thinks he can fool people. He has this art of deceit, D-E-C-E-I-T, deceit. So he deceives people by inviting them and telling them that you haven't been served well in this world. <laughs> and because everybody has that feeling that they are not treated well in their workplace or in their family or in the society, they fall for that trap. So he plays with these things. And the moment he meets the person he stabbed almost to death, or he thought that he stabbed to death, he has this realization that he is cornered. Because what is the reason why this particular person has come? You imagine from that person's foot, imagine I'm sorry, imagine from that situation, what happens when this uh, narrator, Guru Nayak, comes to the astrology? What if, I mean, this is not the case, but what if Guru Nayak has identified this person? He was not able to identify because it's years past and this person has taken an entirely different identical marker. He has a forehead tikka and he has the turban and the saffron robe <coughs> which disguises him and saves him. But what if Guru Nayak has realized that it is the person who pushed him or stabbed him into the well who is living a carefree life here. So when he says, I won't leave you unless you telling me what I am. Guru Nayak is maybe, may not be sure why Guru Nayak is here. The astrologer may not be sure why Guru Nayak is here. So he would probably be trembling. What if Guru Nayak stabs me? So again using his crooked mind, he creates a scenario where he convinces Guru Nayak that the person who stabbed him is dead. He calls Guru Nayak by his name, again earning his trust. <coughs> And caters to his interest by saying that the person was crushed under a lot. When he sees that Guru Nayak is disappointed, dejected, he realized that, okay, Guru Nayak ko pata nahi ki this is me. So he continues to play his trick. He extends it further and says that, do not get out of your village. He says that out of fear, not, for the, not out of the concern of Guru Nayak. It is his fear for his life that makes him, I'm sorry, tell Guru Nayak that do not get out of your village. He succeeds in convincing Guru Nayak to do that. He is able to do that because of his pretentious identity. And as a result of this, he can continue to remain in this masked identity. He can continue to make a living of what he has been doing for years. I hope that's clear, Shabnamji. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, sir. The same, the same theme can be seen in a different way in uh, Arun Joshi's short story. The only American from a village. Because Dr. Kanna has a multicultural identity shift. He was an Indian. He became an American, a diasporic American. And he fell for the American culture. He married an American lady. And he started relishing in that American identity to such an extent that he ignored his father until his death. So the moment this is questioned by Radhe Shah, 
he is out of his thoughts. He cannot be that former self again. He cannot be convincing. He cannot be confident. Because morally he is shattered. So the same theme comes in a different way. <coughs> in tunes to the alienation. That is integral to existential crisis. Or that is common to the uh, narratives of Camus and Sartre. I hope that's clear. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's clear now. Yeah.